think about our Christians becoming profane. I don't mean that Christians are using profanity when I say that, although that's one manifestation of our tendency to become profane. Profane means that we take that which is set apart for God, that which is holy, special, and treat it as though it were no big deal. It's just not important. Rather, we treat it like it's something common, expected everyday kind of thing with no great value, no greater value than anything else, and perhaps in some of our lives even of less value than some things. There's an admonition found in the book of Hebrews chapter 12. If you'll turn there in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 15 and 16, we find this issue addressed. And the writer of Hebrews, talking about the life of Esau, the twin brother of Jacob, says these words, See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it many be defiled, that there be no immoral or godless person like Esau, who sold his own birthright for a single meal. Let's bow together in prayer. Fathers, we come to the word of life today. We ask, Lord, that you will feed us that which we need to really live, to really appreciate who you are and who we are in you. But Father, we will not take for granted all the blessings that are offered to us, but, Lord, that we'll reach out and grasp the true things, the true values, and hold on to those though we lose all else. Lord, we ask that your Holy Spirit will open our hearts as well as our minds today. That, Father, we might be moved towards you before it's too late. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. The exhortation here addresses a problem that is destroying churches today, condemning generations to a lifetime of trouble and defilement. Sometimes all this is happening in the name of marketing the church, the Christian faith, to the next generation. The writers of Hebrews ask the people of the church there to watch over their fellowship. The word is episcopal. Everybody been to an episcopal church? Episcopal church? You heard of that? Well, the, the idea is there is that it's something that you watch over. That's the real meaning of the word. Sometimes it's translated as bishop if you have a King James in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, it talks about if a man desires the office of a bishop, well, it's the idea of being an overseer, of watching over the people of the church. Remember we were talking in Acts chapter 20, verse 28, this is the responsibility of a pastor. It's one of the major roles of those who are elders in the church. And Paul writes there, having called for the elders, he says, therefore take heed of yourselves and to all the flock, Watch yourselves and watch the flocks, among which the Holy Spirit has made you, and here's the word, episcopal, made you overseers to shepherd, that is, pastor the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Now, the writer of Hebrews is not just addressing pastors, although I believe he's putting that responsibility on the elders, on the men who are in leadership and have that role and that responsibility. But he's saying to everybody, we need to watch out because there are problems coming. We need to look for three kinds of problems in the church. And he mentions them there. They start with the word that. We need to be careful lest anyone have come short of the grace of God. We need to be very careful that nobody misses out on the gospel of grace because they just didn't understand it or they thought they had it already. Secondly, we need to be careful that we don't have a Christian who has a bitter root springing up in their life. And then finally, we need to make certain that no one at Bible Center has become so secular in their morality that they are now an immoral and godless person. I began this study trying to do a biographical study of the life of Esau. Esau intrigued me, and I wanted to study him. And the evaluation of Esau occurs at several places in Scripture. The writer of Hebrews here is using him as an example. You know, nobody's life is a total waste. 
They can always be used as a bad example. Well, there's a lot more bad stuff in Esau's life than good stuff. One, let me just say something good about Esau. He and his brother finally reconciled and buried their dad. We can at least be at the funeral together without a fight breaking out. Now, I've said something good about Esau. That's almost the totality of it when you actually look at his life. And we're not, at this point, going to take a, examine all of his life. But I just want to look at how Esau exemplifies for us these three problems. And by looking at, at how his life went, we'll be able to understand just a little better how to be on the watch out in our own lives and in the lives of those whom we love and care for. Are they becoming that kind of person? What were Esau's values? I tried to think about that, and I put together a little slide that uh, kind of shows that. Esau was a hunter, and the things that are important to him are bigger. The things that are less important are smaller. And here were the things that were important. When you look at the things of Esau's life, and you look at the diff different things that he spent his time on and he valued, these were the great values in his life, probably in in order, a couple of things that aren't there. One, his birthright is not there because it was absolutely of no worth to him. Do you notice something else that's not there? God is not there. God is not important to Esau. Now Esau was the inheritor of everything. He had all the values. He had all the strengths. He had everything because he was the firstborn. Esau was a twin. One's older and one is younger. That's the way twins work. Those of you who had twins, praise God that one's older and one's younger. They're not both born at the same time. There's, a, there's okay, uh, this was a great thing. They were recognizing, okay, Esau came out first, and there's a recognition, okay, he's the older one. There was this tremendous struggle as they were trying to work their way out uh, of, of the womb. But Esau, because he was older, had the promise he had the birthright and would inherit the promise. Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, we find this promise given to Abraham. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. What a tremendous promise that is. Abraham considered that promise so valuable, he left everything to go where he did not have any idea where he was going. He launched out heading west, not knowing where that was going to take him, where he was going to stop, where he was going to do. He was willing to be a stranger in a strange land. He was even willing to sacrifice the one son to whom God would give the promise and promise to fulfill all of the blessings of him and all of the blessings of the people of the earth because he considered God faithful. He put his value in God. He said, I'm willing to give up everything for him. Esau's daddy, Isaac, was willing to move and keep moving rather than fight, trying to find some place in this land where he could sojourn in peace because he considered this promise of God so valuable that he was willing to give up land, give up wells he had dug to move till finally he got a place and said, well, Matt, now the Lord's given us a place. He was willing to pray for his wife who was barren that they might have a child because he knew this promise is going to come in another generation. He was willing to suffer and give up and pray and do everything necessary because the promise was all important. And then comes Esau. Esau really didn't value the promise at all. Look at Genesis chapter 25. We pick up the story, verse 29. Esau is now an adult. He's probably over 20 years old. He is definitely an adult. And he's doing what Esau does. His great values are outdoors and hunting. And Esau is out there hunting. He comes in and he's famished. And he smells Jacob cooking red beans. Man, and red beans smell good. Wonderful. And Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stew, for I am exhausted. By the way, the scriptures write down, that's another reason he got his nickname Edom, which means red. Because 
he valued those red beans. Man, red beans. I don't even have to have rice. Just red beans. That was enough. And Jacob said, notice what Jacob said, sell me your birthright now. Sell it to me right now. Now notice what Esau said. I'm about to die. Of what use is a birthright to me? And Jacob said, swear to me now. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. And then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went his way. Wait a minute, what just happened? This tremendous promise, he valued so little that he ate a bowl of red beans and got up and walked off like nothing had happened. I'm going to use a term in just a minute about Esau, but I think I'm going to spring it on you now. I think, this is not a biblical term, okay? This is just me thinking. I think the description of clueless fits Esau. He's clueless. He gets up, he walks off. What's going on? Moses tells us. It's one of the great things about the Bible. It tells you what's going on, and it tells you about people, and it says these words of Esau here. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Despised it. That's why it didn't make the list. He thought it's of no value whatsoever. It's not even worth a bowl of red beans. Not worth that value. I'd rather have a bowl of red beans today than an eternity of blessing. I'd rather have a bowl of red beans. I'd rather have what, what will satisfy my immediate needs than have all the wealth of God, all the spiritual value. I'm just concerned about right now, right here and now. That's all I'm interested in. That's all I want. Esau fell short of the grace of God. Now, it wasn't long before his mom and dad heard about this. In fact, some of the people that had served his grandfather Abraham and now we're coming along with Isaac, who is now the new head of the tribe. They heard about it, and they just shook their head. They knew what Abraham had gone through. They had seen what Isaac had gone through. There were people out herding sheep for his daddy that just shook their head at that boy. How could anybody be that clueless? How could anybody, to have the privilege of one day being the head of the tribe, to be the one who's going to carry on the promise that his children one day are going to be the inheritors of the promise, and one day even the one who's going to fulfill the promise. And he just said, it's no big thing. That's Esau. Clueless in terms of spiritual things, of no great value. Have you come short of the grace of God? Remember in Hebrews it said, make, make real careful that some, none of you fall short or come short of the grace of God. Some people seek salvation by trying to follow the rules of the law. That was what Paul was talking about. I think that may be in, in part what the writer of Hebrews was talking about. Uh, Galatians 5, 4 would be a reference. You just want to jot that down to look at that. But having all the grace, God offering you salvation is a gift. I'll give it to you if you'll acknowledge my son Jesus Christ and put your trust in him. And these folks were saying, well, you know, that's pretty good, but it's kind of tough. I think I'm going to go back to synagogue because I like the rituals. I think we'll go back to synagogue because all my business partners trade there. And they've cut me off because I've begun following Christ. And it's a lot easier for me to just go back and follow the rules of the law. Let me keep the Ten Commandments. There's some people that just, they miss out on it for those reasons. Other people get wrapped up in the things of this world. Jesus told about the parable of the sower. Remember that, that which grew up among the weeds and it just choked it. They just never, I was so busy making a living, so busy enjoying life, so busy doing this, I just didn't have time. Some people are so impressed with their family that I just don't have time for God because I'm just so busy. I mean, you can be busy if you're going to soccer and ball and basketball and ballet and dance and Tired already just thinking about it. Not to mention homework. And they just get so wrapped up that they miss out on the grace of God for whatever reason. Let me just hit a little peeve that I hit as a preacher sometimes. You meet somebody and say, 
you know, and they'll find out you're preaching. You know, I had an uncle who was a preacher. Nice. Won't save you. My grandparents were saved. My parents were saved. My grandparents on my dad's side were saved. Doesn't mean I'm saved. Esau could have said, well, my, my grandfather Abraham was, man, he was a friend of God. So I got it knocked. I don't have to value spiritual. I don't have to do anything, me anything about spirituality. He's taking care of all of that. Some people miss out on the grace of God. Have you ever gotten over how amazing grace is? That God would let you in? I'm not putting you down. I'm just saying, listen, what God offers to us and the terms he gives, good grief. How could you miss out on that? Why would you miss out on that if you had a brain in your head? I think we need to be careful that we put forth the gospel of grace so people don't miss out on it. That I know that you can tell the gospel as clearly as you can. You can explain that Jesus died on the cross, that God raised him from the dead, giving testimony that that sacrifice was accepted, telling us that Jesus Christ is the one by whom he's going to save the world or condemn the world based on our trust in him and what we do with Jesus Christ. And it's like talking to blind people and deaf people. I know the Spirit of God has got to reach in and open up the heart. I know it's a work of conversion through the Spirit. We've got to do everything we can to make it as clear as we can so that people don't miss out on the grace of God and think, well, it's the grace of God plus something else. That's not it. God wants to give us salvation and all the spiritual riches as well as all the material things just as a gift of grace. There is a kingdom coming. We're looking for a city whose builder and maker is God, not man. But that's a long view of things. And Esau didn't have that view. Maybe that's where you are. You're so wrapped up in material things that you like the Christianity thing if it works. Rather than recognizing what God is going to give you, he's going to give you everything in his time. If Esau had trusted God, he would have died not having seen the promise of God fulfilled. But he would have been able to see it afar off and know it was coming. Second thing we need to be careful about is there a root in you that's going to produce bitterness. It's spring, almost spring here in Louisiana. I've seen a lot of things budding out. And I've got some things in the ground that I assume are going to come back up. They came up last year unbidden, and I assume they're going to come back this year some mint. Whatever you do, don't plant three mint plants. One is a lifetime supply. But I had one that I had eradicated from my garden, and I spent about an hour combating it again after it came back up unbidden, you know, just sprang up. The root is going to come up. Bitter roots are going to produce bitter fruit. Esau despised the things of God, and the bitterness over losing his birthright began working on Esau. Long before the incident that we find in Genesis 27, that bitterness he felt gave fruit to these words, I'm going to kill my brother someday. Listen to his bitter cry. Genesis 27, 34. As soon as Esau heard the words of his father, what were the words of his father? Yes, and he shall be blessed. Remember Jacob had snuck in and stolen the blessing. And when Isaac found out, he said, who was that? And then he, it clicked. He was blind, but he was sharp. And he clicked and he said, yes. And he, when Esau heard those words, he realized there's no turning back. I have lost everything that's really worthwhile. And he cried out with an exceeding great and bitter cry and said to his father, Bless me, even me also, O oh my father. The writer of Hebrews says this in Hebrews 12, 17, For you know that afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected 
for he found, listen, no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. There was no way to turn things around. The blessing had gone to someone else. It produced a bitterness in the life and the mind of Esau. The one thing that Esau really valued, remember what it was? Bowl of red beans. Satisfying his stomach. Having in the immediate time, he lost even that because he lost the blessing. Notice the blessing that fell on Jacob. Here's what Jacob received. May God give you heaven's dew and earth's richness and abundance of grain and new wine. Esau wanted that. Didn't care about the birthright, but he wanted that. But because he despised the things of God, he would miss out on that. What did he get? Well, let me do it this way. I'm going to do it in quotes. His blessing was your dwelling will be away from the earth's riches, away from the dew of heaven above. And what he wanted, it went right past him. It's gone. And there's no chance to bring it back. He missed out on the very things he valued because of that. What Esau failed to understand, and what secular, carnal, natural people don't understand, only God satisfies. The song, and I'm going to sing it for you, but the, the part of the words that I remember, the world will try to satisfy that longing in your soul. You may search the wide world o'er, but you'll be just as before. You'll never find true satisfaction until you found the Lord, for only Jesus can satisfy your soul. It's only in Him. There is no other way. Listen, if you're pursuing anything else, it's going to pass right by you, and you're going to miss what God has for you. Notice the next thing that he lost. May nations serve you and peoples bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers and may the sons of your mother bow down to you. Esau had already lost that by selling the birthright. From now on, he got no respect from Jacob. Jacob got the best place. He had to sit in the second place because he sold that. He lost it. That which he thought was not worthwhile because it didn't have any material value. He couldn't see it. He was clueless. He missed out on that. He lost all of it. What did he get instead? What was his blessing? You'll live by the sword, and you will serve your brother. Remember what Jesus said? Those that live by the sword will die by the sword. You're not going to be able to get along with anybody. You're going to be warlike all your life. You could have had people bowing down and serving you. Instead, you're just going to have to fight for survival. At this point, somebody probably should have asked Esau, somebody less gracious than you and I, was a bowl of red beans really worth it? At the time he thought so, but it really was not. But the greatest loss of all for Esau, he lost the protection of the Almighty. Notice the words here. May those who curse you be cursed, and those who bless you be blessed. Child of God, do you realize what a valuable thing it is to be on God's side? To stand in the shadow of the Almighty? And to know that there's no one and nothing that can harm you while He's there, except by His permission, for your good? to accomplish the good he plans for you in your life. Do you, do you realize what a blessing that is? There are people in this world that terrible, tragic things are happening to them, and as far as the purpose of their life, it's absolutely pointless. They're just suffering because they're in the world. But you have received the grace of God. God has extended that grace to you, and that blessing is yours. God is going to take every hurt, every wrong, every injustice, every piece of suffering, every heartache, and it's all working together for good for you to make you like his son, Jesus Christ. God is working all these things out for you. He's a, he is manipulating things to accomplish his purposes in your life, to get you where he wants you to be, the place of ultimate blessing and ultimate satisfaction. 
you and I both know, if you've lived very long, that you can look back and you can see some of the blessing of God, where God has saved you and spared you by things at the time you thought were heartache. Multiply that by infinity when you get to heaven and God reveals your life and he shows you the whole pattern of things, you're going to realize, wow, thank you, Lord. Thank you for all the things you took away. Thank you for all the heartache you put me through. Worth every bit of it. God, you're on my side. What a blessing to have God on your side. Esau got none of that. That's why I say it's a quote, unquote, blessing. Here's the words. But when you grow restless, you will throw his yoke from off your neck. You what, see what the blessing of Esau was? One of these days, when you get tired enough of it, you're going to curse the Lord's anointed, and God's going to deal with you. That was his blessing. Rather than being content and satisfied with God's will and God's choice, Esau said, give me a blessing. And his father very prophetically said, you as a bitter root are going to rebel and bring the curse of God upon your life. Listen to Ezekiel 23, verses 12 to 14. This is what the sovereign Lord says. Because Edom, remember what his nickname was? Edom, whole nation of the Edomites, the descendants of Esau. Because Edom took revenge on Judah and became very guilty by doing so, therefore this is what the sovereign Lord says. I will stretch out my hand against Edom and kill both man and beast. I will lay it waste. And from Teman to Dedan, they will fall by the sword. I will take vengeance on Edom by the hand of my people Israel, and they will deal with Edom in accordance with my anger and my wrath. They will know my vengeance, declares the sovereign Lord. You can despise the grace of God. You can say, God, I don't want your best. I'm willing to settle for second best. Be very, very careful what you reject and what you'll take. Once you have rejected God's best for you, God's blessing for you, there is only the anticipation of the full result of the curse. Do you see why it says in Hebrews, there was no place for repentance, though he sought it with a bitter tears. One bitter person can ruin many people. Here's Esau's family tree. Esau ruined a whole nation and brought condemnation upon them. All of his descendants wiped out in the vengeance of God. A bitter father and a bitter mother can make a whole family bitter against God and the things of God. A bitter member of a church can ruin a whole lot of people in the church. Sour your outlook on church and the things of God and bring disgrace and discord and disharmony to the unity of the church. That's why he says be very careful. Watch out that somebody has not dealt with bitterness and not come to the place where they've recognized that God is sovereign and forgiveness comes from him and extend that forgiveness to others who have wronged or in your eyes wronged you. Be very careful that a bitter root does not spring up. Finally, the final thing we're admonished here, and I ask this question, are you compromising with secular morals? Are you compromising with secular morals? Secular morals are the values of the natural man, the person who doesn't have their mind on the things of God. Two areas that he mentions here. One is in the area of sexual immorality. Now some of your versions will just use the word immoral, but really it's the word pornos, from which we get the word pornography. He's talking very specifically about sexual immorality. It talks about a perversion of what God has created of this thing of sex, and it takes on many forms. Now in Esau, it shows up in his attitude toward marriage. Esau was a man who married as he pleased, whom he pleased. When he got to be 40 years old, at a time when you really ought to have some sense, he marries two women and their bitter marriages. 
They make the life, the scriptures say, of Isaac and Rebekah, his mother and father, they made their life bitter. See that word showing up again, that bitter root. He marries two Canaanite women, Judith and Basimuth, and they are miserable people. I told them in Sunday school, we were, in, uh, we were at the park. These two girls came in with their three children. They were on the phone the whole time, but not to each other. These two friends come to the park. They're on the cell phone the whole time. I wish they'd at least have walked off and talked because some of the words they were using. I heard one of them say, you know, are you on grass? You must still be high on grass. And I'm thinking of these three kids. I'm thinking, good grief. And I thought, you know, I've got a great daughter-in-law because I could have one of these two. And my life would be bitter because of these two. And uh, because this subject is on profanity, I'm not going to tell you some of the things and why I moved my little granddaughter down on the far end, so hopefully she won't pick up some of those words that I know and she doesn't need to know. That was Esau's wives. He, picked two, he married two at the same time. This is a bright boy. Clueless. He marries two at the same time, and they're both miserable. They have no value for God, and he's not looking for a woman that values God. That's not important to him. He's looking for women that are going to satisfy him. That's all he's concerned about. They made his mother and dad's life bitter. Now, he is clueless, but he finally gets a clue. Rebecca, and particularly Isaac, send Jacob off and said, Now you go back to your mother's people and get your wife there. Get, don't marry one of these Canaanite women. And it dawns on him. My dad don't like my Canaanite wives. So what does he do? He goes to his dad's half-brother Ishmael, his dad's rival, and gets a third wife. Now I've got two Canaanite wives and a wife that's an Ishmaelite. Like that's going to help mom and dad. Even when he gets a clue, this boy's clueless. He doesn't get it. He doesn't understand who on earth would think that having two miserable wives and marrying a third is going to solve the problem? It doesn't say in Scripture, but my suspicion is it didn't solve the problem with Isaac and Rebekah. Their life was miserable already, and that just made it worse. I can't believe you're bringing in another wife. He was sexually immoral, and he shows up in the life that he lives. It is a terrible thing that we have to say today that a lot of Christians live sexually immoral lives. Raised in church, maybe made a profession of faith, may even be believers. How many of you men recognize that the making or breaking of your life was your wife? Raise your hand real quick. There was somebody else you could have married. A friend of mine, he used to sweep up at the church in Memphis, and we would talk because he was over a retired man, and he, he said, I had a, there was a girl I could have married. He said, I heard about her the other day. She's running the nudist colony. <laughs> so I just thank the Lord that he got me out of that one. Listen, there is no more important decision for you, child of God, than to marry a man or woman of God who values God over you, who fears God, more than he fears you. Loves God more than he loves you. You can find one of those, and if you can possibly work it out, marry him, and do everything you can to serve God with that person because it will either make you or break you. I remember when I was younger, and I, was, I, I have always been older. I've always had a good deal of wisdom, partly because I started studying the Bible for myself when I was about 15 years of age. I was rock-solid stupid when it came to women. I mean, God has just been gracious. But I did know this. I knew I need to find a good Christian girl. My problem was finding one that wanted to marry me. <laughs> Even when you think you know what's going on, listen, you better put that in the Lord's hand. You better say, God, you better work that because it will make you or break you. Isaac... Rebecca, miserable over Esau because he manifested, I don't have a clue. Listen, if you've got somebody that doesn't have a clue, read the Song of Solomon. 
and read the end part about what do you do if your sister is ugly? Well, you adorn her. What do you do if she's an open door? Well, you build a wall around her. You try to protect her. If she doesn't have any sense, you try to protect her. You try to keep her from these people that are no good for her. Anyway, that's all I've got to say right now on that subject because we've got to go on because this second feature is key to everything we've been talking about. Esau was a godless man because he did not have his mind on the things of God. Now, the word godless here, it's the word profane. And when we use the word profane, you think about profanity. So not a good word. Let me explain what this Greek word meant. It actually meant if you have a temple area and you've got a holy area, around that holy area there's a common ground where everybody can go. In the temple, it was that big courtyard where the Gentile, even the Gentiles could come. That's where they set up buying and selling and exchanging money because it was such a common area. Nobody can suit of any value any great spiritual worth. Esau was the kind of guy, he thought everything was dirt cheap, dirt common. For him, nothing was holy, nothing was sacred. He was a godless man. That's why the birthright, he despised it because he thought that's nothing compared to me getting something to eat, satisfying the desires of my body. He was a godless, profane, common, and considered things of spiritual worth to be common. How do we know that? He lives with two godless women. Marries two godless pagan women. How do we know that? His rejection of God is seen in seeking another blessing from God. Rather than submitting to the will of God, he turns his back on all of that and says, I want a blessing. So God gave him a blessing that was a curse. It shows up in his solution to pagan marriages by marrying a third woman as if that would solve it. You see, this godlessness, this refusal to recognize that there is holy and that holy is valuable above all else. That holy is what I want. I want to be holy. Esau said, I don't care about being holy and I don't care about holy things. John Calvin, in his commentary on Hebrews, says this, Profane then, are all they in whom the love of the world so reigns and prevails that they forget heaven, as is the case with those who are led away by ambition, or become fond of money or of wealth, or give themselves up to gluttony, or become entangled in any other pleasures. They allow in their thoughts and cares no place, or it may be the last place, the spiritual kingdom of God. Let me ask you three questions, or let's turn it around. Why don't you ask these questions of yourself? Three questions. Have I missed the grace of God? Am I just doing the religious thing in the hope that it'll one day make God pleased with me? Have I missed the grace of God? Don't miss out on that. Is there a bitterness within me? Do I get angry over something? I'm just bitter over something that happened maybe a short time ago, maybe a long time ago, and I've never dealt with it. And then the third question, are my values secular, not sacred? How do we watch out? One, we need to recognize that there may be people sitting right around us, maybe people you're teaching in Sunday school class, maybe somebody you're sitting and having a conversation with, and they've missed it. They've missed the gospel of grace. We need to make real sure that we make it clear you may have children that have missed out on the grace of God. They don't understand it. They, they think it's what they do, and they're trying hard to be perfect. Or they quit trying hard to be perfect, and they finally said, just forget it. I'm going to go out and do what I want to do. And they've missed the grace of God. Sit down and tell them. Preach the gospel of grace clearly to those children, to those friends. Make sure they understand. Don't leave it alone just assuming. Make sure they have understood God's grace. The third thing, we need to confront sexual immorality when it shows up in our own lives and in the lives of others. There are secret pleasures we tolerate that could ruin our life. We need to recognize it's not a plaything. It's not just amusement. 
these things are destructive and deadly. There are ideas floating around out there about sexuality that will destroy the lives of the people who adopt them, whether you're a Christian or not. We need to confront immorality when it shows up. And then finally, we need to exhort God's people to be holy, not irreverent. How do we solve all this? Well, how do you bring it together? Let me suggest this as a closing thought. I can show respect for the Savior by being reverent. That's not being godless, being God-minded. It'll solve a lot of profanity out of the mouth. It'll recognize that I belong to God and God is holy. I need to be reverent about the things of God. I need to recognize that God's things are holy and they're far better than my things, the things that I want, the things that concern me. I want to be like that. I don't want him to be like me. I want to speak of my Savior reverently, not flippantly, not casually, but I want to speak of holy things in a holy way. That'll help us move in this direction of recognizing this is what's valuable in my life. Let's bow together in prayer. Father, you say, be ye holy as I am holy. Lord, to think of where you took us from and to offer us the opportunity of being holy. Father, we'd be a fool to turn that down to accept the things of this world, to revel in them, to let anything get between us and being holy as you are holy. Father, we confess that oftentimes we've used profanity. But Lord, more often that we've spoken of holy things in a common manner and treated them as though they meant nothing rather than recognizing they meant everything because you mean everything. Lord, I pray if there's someone here today who's gotten trapped in irreverence, Lord, who's missed out on the grace of God, that, Father, your Holy Spirit will so open their heart and mind that they'll not be satisfied until they find out what the solution is, till they find out what the gospel really is, till they find out what they've missed out on. Lord, they'll read, they'll talk, they'll ask, but Father, they'll not let it alone until they figure out and find out what it is to be under the grace of God in salvation and in life. We ask this, Lord, because it's great for us. But Lord, we more particularly ask for it because it is your will for our life as believers. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen.